welcome. I'm Alan Rutberg. I'm director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy here at the Truman School. Um, we have the very great privilege and pleasure today of um, having David Wolfson come to talk to us about farmed animal law, and the, in particular about the Farmed Animal Ballot Initiative. Um, David is a partner in Millbank Tweed in New York in uh, global corporate relations. Okay. Um, he also, but he has a long history with animal law. Um, he teaches animal law at NYU. He's taught animal law at Harvard and Columbia law schools. Um, he also teaches at the undergraduate level in NYU's uh, program in, um, in, what's the name of the program? The, uh, the Animal Studies Initiative. Animal Studies Initiative, yes. And so, um, so he knows his way around the business, and, um, and we're very lucky, and I'm very happy to, to introduce him today. So thank you, David. Right. Um, thanks to everyone for inviting me. It's, it's real fun to be back here. I actually um, spent a lot of time at this vet school in the early 90s because I had a girlfriend who went to Tufts Vet School. Um, and actually, I think Dr. Nutter, Felicia Nutter, the professor here, she was also part of that class, and I got friendly with, uh, with everyone. I haven't been back here for 23 years. It looks completely different, um, in large part because it seems that the gender breakdown in the class has changed a little bit, uh, which I think is something that is going on throughout the veterinary community. Um, I believe you guys have something like 85% women in class now, which is very interesting. So. Um, just to give you a little more information about myself, I'm a, a lawyer in New York, and I represent a number of animal protection organizations, so you probably are familiar with most of them. I represent the Humane Society of the United States, I represent um, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and then I represent some of the smaller not-for-profit groups that do more of the sort of edgier stuff. So I represent Compassion Over Killing, I represent Mercy for Animals, that does a lot of the undercover investigations. Um, but I also represent groups like there's an organization called Global Animal Partnership. So I know, is there a Whole Foods anywhere in here? OK. So for those of you who go to Whole Foods, you probably, if you walk by or go to the meat counter, you'll see there's a step labeling program, one step, two step, three step, four step, five step plus, which is a, an attempt to improve the conditions for animals that are being raised for food. And I actually represent Global Animal Partnership that does the labeling system and has the relationship with Whole Foods and does the auditing of the various farms to see that the animals are treated that way. So I sort of have a, um, a, a spectrum of clients on the animal protection slash animal welfare, animal rights uh, spectrum in the sense that I have some clients like Mercy for Animals that you'd probably think of as more as sort of vegan animal rights activists who do undercover investigations and exposing what they believe are all these particular wrongs that are going on in farming. And then I have um, groups that are actually engaged with the farming community through retailers like Whole Foods who are trying to do some type of a labeling system. I have worked for a very long time on farmed animal campaigns. So um, I started in the mid-90s to the late 90s with a group of people from Farm Sanctuary and HSUS. And we actually got together and we did the very first ballot initiative on this issue, which was to uh, prohibit the gestation crate. I'm actually in the one audience that I don't actually have to explain what the gestation crate is. This is really interesting. We had to prohibit, we, we successfully prohibited the gestation crate in Florida in 2002. And then I was involved in another campaign which did the same thing and the veal crate in Arizona. And then I was involved in the big Proposition 2 in California, which um, also focused on battery cages as well as gestation crates and veal crates. And I am involved in the Massachusetts ballot initiative that's going on at the moment, which is a little different. Um, in that it's not only prohibiting these three methods of animal production, but it's also trying to actually prohibit the sale of products derived from those methods of animal production. So shelled eggs, as opposed to liquid eggs, which are just impossible to track. And then veal and pork cutlets, as opposed to pork and bean cans. The idea being that if you're a farmer in Massachusetts, if you don't take an action like that, and you end up raising your animals a way that people would argue it's better, um, you will have no economic advantage if the market is flooded with out-of-state products that are using cheaper methods. And so there's a need to protect the market in the state. In California, after the Proposition 2 was passed, the ballot initiative, it was actually the agricultural industry that lobbied the California legislature and passed a law separately that did exactly what we're trying to do in Massachusetts, which made it illegal to sell eggs that came from battery cages in California. 
So that's my background in this. Um, I think one of the things, I, I, wanted, I don't have much time and I want to make sure that you guys have a chance to answer, ask any questions you might have, but I think what I wanted to do was one, just sort of describe you know, what's going on in the sort of world of animal protection, that is why are people involved and why are people caring, and then talk a little bit about how the law relates to this, and then talk a little bit about what's probably going to happen in the future. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to you guys that people are focused on this. Um, the increase in focus on farmed animal issues is one of the very interesting successes in the animal protection movement in the last 10 years. When I got involved in the 1990s, there was a sense that actually the American public was not open to a discussion about farmed animal issues, that people just wanted to eat their, their, their food, and that anyone who tried to raise issues around this would be very much viewed as an animal rights activist, um, and it was not the way to go. Um, unlike in Europe, but to the extent any of you have any European experience, there are actually a lot of progressive laws in the 90s that improved the situation for farmed animals. But in fact, um, the animal movement did get engaged, and they got engaged for the reasons that I'm sure you're all aware of, which is there is a, deal, a great deal of concern amongst many people that the way animals are raised for food is not um, as good as it could be. Now, there are ranges within the animal protection movement. There are people, and there are many of my clients, who actually don't believe that it can ever be good, and therefore they would argue that there is no reason to do it. And then they would also argue that there are many other reasons to not do it, uh, and would point to issues that have helped really focus on this issue. For example, they would point to the nutrition issues around eating animal products. They would point to the environmental consequences of large-scale industrial farming. They would point to the climate change issues that are going around in relation to this. They might even point to workers' rights issues. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons. Um, but predominantly, they would be focused on the ethical issues of whether the animals are raised appropriately and what the what were the reasons for the, the animals being reared that way. At the same time, I think there's a much larger group of people, uh, American public, that doesn't necessarily think it's inappropriate to raise animals for food and kill them, but does think that animals should be treated well if we're going to do that. And if you look at the polling, there's something like 70% of the American public will say, I think it's important that animals are treated well when they're raised for food. Um, and what seems to have happened in the last 10 years or so is there's been a disconnect between that belief and the presentation of the reality, which is more and more people are becoming uncomfortable with the way animals are being raised for food. In every one of the campaigns that I've been involved with, the agricultural industry that has c competed against us for the votes of the citizens in each state has had a presumption that if they just say, this is the way it should be done, this is how it is, that they will win. And not only have they been losing, they've been losing bigger and bigger every time. We got 55% of the vote in, Calif in Florida. We got 63% of the vote in California. California is a large agricultural state. Um, and in California, we not only got 63% of the vote, that happened to be the highest vote in favor of a ballot initiative in the history of California. And we won every single state, every single county in the state of California but one. And there are a lot of farming counties in the state of California. So there is a belief in our society by a large number of people that what is currently going on is not the way it should be. Uh, that's just a fact. Now where we're going to end up is going to be more, is very interesting because there are some people, as I said, who say we should end up by abolishing the raising of animals for food. There are other people that say, no, we can do it better. And then the question is, how do we do it better? It's particularly the question is, how do we do it better when we raise so many of them? And that's one of the things I always do when if anyone's seen me speak before, I, I always, de by the way, I'm a remarkably depressing speaker. I should have pointed that out at the beginning. Everything I say is very depressing. But one of the things I do point out to everyone is that the numbers of animals that we raise for food is, is really a staggeringly high number. I mean, in the United States, it's like 9.5 billion animals a year. And you guys are aware the overwhelming majority of those animals are chickens, so like 9 billion. Now, the numbers come down a little bit. But uh, it's still very large. And that's not talking about fish or seafood and all of that stuff. And one of the things I like to point out is that when you actually look at how we interact with animals in our society, which you guys are very familiar with. So if we think of all the ways we have animals in our world, what, how do we have them? We have them as companion animals. Uh, we have them maybe in zoos and circuses. Maybe we um, experiment on them for medical research or cosmetic testing. Maybe we hunt 
Uh, maybe we use them in vivisection. Maybe we wear their bodies in fur and fur production. Um, basically, if you try and think of every way that the animals interact with those, uh, and then you put all those animals in a big pile in the middle of this room, and then you add to that pile all the farmed animals that we consume on an annual basis. Either we eat them or we eat things that come from them, like eggs or milk. Of that big pile of animals that I've now put in this room, 98% are farmed animals. Okay, And so that doesn't mean that all the issues that the 2% constitute, such as horse cruelty or companion animal feral cat issues or anything, it doesn't mean that it's not important. It's obviously very important to the individual animals. But it does mean that what we're doing with farmed animals sort of dwarfs everyone else, every, everything else. And also, it does mean, I think, and this is my personal view, that how we, determine, how we view ourselves as a society is in large part determined on how we treat farmed animals. Because that's what we think of animals. People say, what do we think of animals? We should say, well, how do we treat 98% of them? Because that's sort of what we think of them at the end of the day. So why is there a Massachusetts Ballot Initiative even going on? The way that the law relates to animals, and in particular farmed animals, is, is quite problematic. Um, my guess is, I don't know if you're this way, but my guess is if you ask most Americans, what do you think of the way that animals, animals are raised for food? Most of them will say, you know what? It's probably not perfect. In fact, there are probably things I don't want to know about. But there must be some group overseeing it there must be some legal system of some type that has some limitations on what can be done to the animals while they're being raised for food. And the fact is that's just not true. And that's the big issue with farmed animal law. I mean, like, I like to say I became a farmed animal law expert because there is no law, and that makes it very easy to be an expert. But if you look at it and you take it bit by bit, in America, federal law, state law, is there a federal law that relates to how animals are raised while they're being uh, relates to how animals are treated while they're being raised on the farm. No. You guys probably have some familiar with things like the Animal Welfare Act that deals with regulations and requirements about animals in zoos or circuses or even uh, animals in medical research. The farmed animals are exempt from that statute. So there is no federal law at all that deals with how animals are raised for food. And that means the United States Department of Agriculture cannot actually regulate in this area unless they can tie it to something else. Like if they see there's a health issue, a human health issue, some type of meat uh, inspection type issue, they can bring it in. But if it's purely for the welfare of the animal, they have no statutory authority. They're not allowed to do anything. So then what you do is you go to the states to look for the protection. And what has happened in the last 25 years is that state law has been amended by the agricultural interests to specifically exempt out from the reach of those statutes anything that the industry views as common, accepted, customary, or normal. So your average state statute reads something like this. It is a crime to injure, maim, beat, deprive of sustenance any animal in an unnecessary or unjustifiable manner, except if it's a common or normal or accepted or farming practice. So what are the consequences of that? The consequence of that is that whatever the industry decides to do is exempt and the courts can't do anything. Now I actually haven't spent much time talking about how animals are raised for food. All right, um, You guys I think have much more understanding of that than most audiences that I speak to. There are obviously there is a perception in our society by a large number of people that there is something that isn't working very well and that the animals haven't, are no longer, if they ever were, the center of the process. That is, they become something that is utilized as a product to get a result rather than their own individual um, welfare being respected. And that's especially in the case of like chickens, where you just have these large, large numbers where losing a few animals or a large number of animals, 1%, 2%, 3%, it's just not considered that significant. So what interests me about the law is not so much as a lawyer what interests me about it is we can decide whether or not farming is cruel today. But the way these laws are structured, it can become even remarkably cruel in the future and there is nothing that a court can do. All they have to say is, do other farmers do it? 
If they do, I'm sorry, I can't say anything. So the result of that, along with the few states that don't have those exemptions, but these are all very much criminal laws that have to be enforced by a district attorney. Um, so I think you can imagine if you've got a big farming state and you've got someone who's unhappy with something that's going on in the farm, you have to go in and persuade the local district attorney that that is a bad thing. And if that farm is doing exactly the same thing as everyone else is in the United States and being subsidized by the federal government to do it, the likelihood of a criminal filing and a, a, a criminal determination being made is minimal. And that's why it's never happened. Um, there has been no enforcement against what are typical farming practices anywhere in the United States. There have been cases where you find some, some individual that decided to like beat a pig to death with a metal bar for no reason. And that is viewed as something that's so gratuitous and separate from the process that it's fair game. But most of the time, it's really, really, really hard. Um, so the legal system at the moment, and that's how animals are raised for food. Transport, there's a few laws, but they're not enforced. And slaughter, there's a Humane Slaughter Act, but you guys are probably aware, chickens are exempt from it. So that's back to the 90% of the animals that we were talking about. So when I step back and I look at what is the legal protection for farmed animals in this country, nothing is not a terribly inaccurate description until recently through the efforts of the animal protection movement, which started, as I said, in Florida and then moved to Arizona and went to California. And now it's popped up in a number of legislatures and now you guys are the battleground for 2016. And it is a specific decision. I mean, people decided Massachusetts was a good place to go. Um, I think there's a belief that there's a community here that's very receptive and open to the argument. I think there's a belief that if Massachusetts moves, then that's a very significant state to move. It seems that there's a lot of attention being, pay, being made on the coasts of the United States for progressive policy. And there is also a belief that every time one of these ballot initiatives happens, the industry does move in reaction to it. So for those of you who follow this stuff, when we had the Florida bill and ban the gestation crate, there was a move within the pig industry to move away from gestation crates to group housing. They said they'd do it, then they changed their mind, then they said they'd do it, then they changed their mind, but it looks like they're going to do it. And similarly, the growth from battery cages to some type of alternative chicken producing system, egg producing system has been remarkable, especially when you tie that into the demands of the, uh, of the, of the public now, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So there's definitely been some changes, but the thing that's complicated about this issue is, and again, you guys have a better understanding of this than, than I do, is that you're dealing with a remarkably large number of animals on a daily basis. I mean, you try and get these numbers to play out. So one thing is, I think it's like 263 chickens a second, 500, 1,500, I mean, it's just remarkably complicated. Large numbers of animals. Um, a whole host of different species that may have different requirements. Battles about what is appropriate ways of raising animals. Do pigs need rooting, straw, how much space is appropriate? Is group housing really work with inside or outside activity? Are we anthropomorphizing them? Are we doing things that make it worse? Is the gestation crate better or worse than you know, group housing because they can fight with each other? Uh, you know, all of these issues. And at this point, there is no regulatory structure to deal with that. Because when you generally have issues that are complicated, like if you look at, for example, the way animals are regulated for medical research, there is a federal statute with a regulatory system with a USDA agency coming in and, comp and there are loads and loads of regulations that get changed all the time and, and the agency can come in and inspect places without search warrants and all of this stuff. And so if you really want to tackle the, I mean, the first question is a good one, which is can you ever tackle it? I mean, given that we're producing this much food, can you ever really design a system that would really take into account the welfare of animals? I mean, I guess I can envision a system which could do it at a lot lower production amount. Uh, and if you look at the small animal farm, the small farms that have been doing this, they run much smaller numbers. If you look at slaughterhouse facilities where you feel that the animals are really being given the attention that they need, you see a much slower slaughter process. So, you know, the question of whether you can do it is, is a good one. But if you are going to do it, what is the best way to do it? And it's complicated. Um, you guys are probably also familiar with what these things called the ag gag laws, agriculture, right? So one of the reactions that the industry has done is it said, 
we don't want these animal rights investigators coming in undercover and then showing how bad we look. They're, they're, they're not real, they're, they, they make them up, and so on. And so we pass these laws that make it a crime if you lie on a job application to come in and, you know, are you, have you ever been a member of HSUS? As opposed to it used to be the Communist Party, but whatever. Um, and so if you lie on that and then you do footage, that's bad. If you, um, if you take a picture of an animal in distress, you're required immediately to tell people because they say they should need to know, but it makes it very hard to build a case. All of these laws, I think there are maybe four states that have passed them. There's one that's been found unconstitutional that's going to be appealed. There's another one that's being challenged. Um, it's an interesting tactic by, by the industry. But it, it, it's, it's actually rubbing against something which is very counter. I mean, you can chat about whether you think it's a good tactic or not, another, uh, not a good tactic. But when I look at, you know, oh, no, I'll just say one point and I'll go somewhere else. But even the changes that we've done up to this point, you know, the success we've had in the legal areas in terms of gestation crates, battery cages, real crates, it's just a tiny amount of how animals are raised for food. And so to go forward and try and deal with it is going to be very complicated. So I guess the question is, well, how do you, if you want to improve the system, how do you improve it? Obviously, you can try legal methods as we have been trying with legislation. We've been very cautious about it in that we do very specific, defined legislation at various levels. One of the reasons we do it this way is because we couldn't be successful any other way. The HSUS actually tried to pass a federal law in D.C. with the support of the United Egg Producers to phase out battery cages over like 15 years. Um, they actually had a deal with the UEP that they would go in and agree to support this law uh, because the UEP preferred it than being attacked in these ballot initiatives that have much shorter time periods. Massachusetts, if this law is passed, they've got four years to get rid of the battery cage. Um, I don't think there's a huge battery cage production system here, but they, they're worried about that. So um, they, they failed in D.C. because the animal industry or the other parts of the animal industry just said we're not having any laws at all. We don't want it. So we can't go to do that. So maybe we do some of the state stuff. But what seems to be happening, which is really interesting, is that no one really seems to be that interested in law and farmed animals anymore um, in terms of how things get changed. You're a different generation, all of you in this room. I mean, the millennials, one of the things that seems to be happening, and actually The Economist had a statement about this in their magazine a few weeks ago, is that your generation in particular cares about ethical decision-making when you consume things and when you buy things. And the focus on compassionate consumerism has become really intense. Uh, it's grown dramatically in the last five, six years, not only in the United States, but in China. And what's amazing about that growth is it's grown in the face of one of the biggest recessions in the history. And yet still people care enough about their ethical decision-making around consumer choices. And so what you actually see in terms of how the world is changing is you see groups of people saying to co companies, if you raise your animals this way, we won't buy your product. And now you see this HSUS and other groups have taken on that as a tactic. And it's probably more effective than any of the legal stuff that we're doing. Um, which means there's an interesting you know, situation going on of how far this is going to go. In the animal rights movement, there's a lot of conflict. Because there are a lot of people who think that these tactics are the worst things that you could ever do to make animals' worlds better. They think that if you tell people that it's possible to raise animals well and eat them, or you give them the impression that that can be done, then in fact what you have done is you've hoodwinked them. Because in fact animals can never be raised well. And moreover, when people think they're being raised well, they, do, they lose all their activist energy and they just start eating the animals like I wouldn't have eaten a, veal, veal, a piece of veal, but now I think the baby cow has been raised the right way, I eat the piece of veal. And so there's, as always in the animal rights movement, there's like a civil war going on. That's, that's nothing new. That's been there forever. Um, and there are a lot of people who say, no, these are not the tactics. The only tactics you should do are veganism, diet, education, don't raise animals for food. And that side is getting a lot of energy, not less so from the ethical perspective, but more from the climate change environmental consequences. I mean, you just cannot deny, if you are a serious environmentalist, that the large amount of meat production, as currently done, is problematic. The environmental industry for, or community for a long time tried to get around that, I think, with some sort of, and here I'm going to be critical, some sort of mythology that, well, 
that's a natural way to do this and we just need to move back to how animals are raised naturally and then we'll consume them, which is highly um, romantic in part, but also I think problematic if you want to in any way try and get to the levels of meat production that we have now. But then with the issues around climate change um, and the pollution around things and the use of resources and water and electricity and so on, industrial farming as currently constituted is becoming highly problematic. And so, um, you know, people are really focused on it. Uh, the other area which you guys are probably fam very familiar with is the labeling movement. Right back to what I said with Whole Foods. Huge civil war in the animal rights movement again. That it can never be done properly, that the industry is simply pretending, it's regulating itself. These standards mean nothing. Misleading. And it's actually, I mean, if you live long enough, you get to appreciate the irony of everything. I mean, I, uh, I, I started working with people on undercover investigations on animal you know, farms, and it was a brilliant tactic. And I think it's fantastic until the animal rights groups start using that tactic against the organizations that I'm arguing are doing really good treatment of animals and their labeling programs. So now what's actually happening is animal rights activists are doing undercover investigations of whole food producers claiming that whole foods labeling is not right. So it's just like everyone's attacking everyone now. Um, the labeling programs, there's a lot of them, Animal Care Certified, or Animal, American Humane, Animal Welfare, GAP, Consumer Reports has got heavily involved in this. Um, and that's a whole complication, like we can talk about that. I want to make sure you guys have enough time to ask questions. So, in summary, I guess I would say, one, from a legal perspective, which is why I'm here, I guess, not a lot of stuff going on, a lot of problems. I do not believe the law reflects the reality of what Americans expect it should in this place, in this particular context. Two, society seems to be shifting on this issue. Whether or not the industry believes what they're doing is right, the public doesn't agree with them anymore. And that's actually been one of the things that the industry has said. You see this with Ringling Brothers in another area. Ringling Brothers doesn't agree, they say, with all of the arguments made by HSUS and others, Born Free, Animal Welfare Institute, does not agree that elephants are treated badly in circuses. If you read their statement, they said when they decided to take elephants out of circuses in like three years from now, but they've now accelerated to today because they know what's going on, they said, we are not doing this because those animal rights activists forced us to do this. Well, we're not doing it because we think it's wrong. We're doing it because our consumers are telling us they don't want it. Uh, same problem with SeaWorld, with the, uh, with, you know, the orcas, you know, it doesn't matter what really doesn't matter what um, the marine parks think. This is changing. It's why I'm not really bothered by ag-gag laws. In the animal rights world, a lot of people are terrified about ag-gag laws. I'm not really bothered by it. I mean, I don't like it, but I don't think that just because the industry says you can't look at what we're doing, that means that everyone's going to stop looking at what they're doing. I think this thing is going to go on anyway. So real legal problem, lots of issues around the ethics and the welfare, lots of problems. Um, sustainability issues, climate change issues, environmental issues, uh, and something's going to change because it is changing. Now, what it's going to end up being, I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know that um, I, I, I personally think in the United States and in Europe, there's going to be more and more pressure on people who raise animals for food to assert why they're doing so in an appropriate and humane way. And that raises a lot of ethical issues and a lot of challenges in doing so. There is definitely going to be a growth of this industry in South America, in India, and in particularly in China. Um, and that's going to be highly problematic. But I think the issues, the same issues are going to come over there, especially with the climate change stuff that's going on. So that's sort of an overview, and that explains why all these animal protection advocates are in your backyard doing what they're doing. Um, I, the polling, when I last heard about it, looks very, very good. I mean, I, I, I would be, we'll see, but ho I think that law will probably pass. Um, especially if there's going to be a really high turnout in this next election, which I have a feeling there's going to be a really high turnout. So we shall see. So I wanted to stop there at 25 to, because I think you guys have to leave at 10 to, and I didn't know if you wanted to ask any questions. I can talk again for another five minutes if no one has one question to ask. Oh, we have a question. Great. <laughs> well, 
the, 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 you know, there's a lot of, it's a great question, and there's a lot of um, elements of conflict within it. So, firstly, in order to do it in the United States, you have to pick some, in some type of a, uh, an entity to be responsible for that process. So, for example, one of the reactions to the animal protection movement passing laws in certain states has been the industry uh, coming back and setting up commissions to do exactly what you're saying, which is saying, look, there's a, you need an area of expertise in this, and we want to put together an inst some type of a commission that will make decisions that are for the best. Um, there is some tension there from, from various community actors. I mean, if it's going to be the federal government and the USDA, there's a lot of concern from people outside of that community that the USDA is making the right decisions. But I think most importantly, and this is where you guys really come into the picture, and I, I, have, I do have some bias in this, but it's, I defer to your expertise. A lot of this comes down to how you determine the answer to your question. How do you determine those metrics? How do you determine whether an animal prefers one system to another? How do you prefer, determine whether or not the animal is suffering? Whether the animal is suffering appropriately for the purpose of what you're doing? So, you know, we did a case in New Jersey where we questioned common farming practices, and one of the issues was, um, was it appropriate to, to trim the beaks of certain birds to put them in small cages? And one answer is that causes suffering to animals and it's not appropriate. Another answer is, well, it causes some suffering, but if you didn't do it and you put them in those cages, then it would be far, far worse for the bird. And the court was very sympathetic to that. They were like, it's a balancing issue and, you, and the New Jersey entity has a responsibility to work that out. For me, and this is where it gets complicated, Science is an essential element of this. We need studies that do prove metrics. We need requirements that have some solid basis. But science alone, in my opinion, is only one element of the process. You can't come to conclusions solely with scientific results. You have to apply some ethical balancing test to those scientific results to determine whether or not it's appropriate. Like I say, I can tell you that a pig in a gestation crate is much better than a pig in a very small space with two other pigs, right? You can follow how much the animal is eating, you can give them medication, you don't have to worry about whether they're fighting for food and they're not beating each other up. So that seems a simple thing. But there's also another question there, which is are either of those two systems appropriate and is there another system that's bigger than that that you don't have these downsides and you have more upsides? And then of course that comes to another question which I haven't even mentioned and I appreciate the questions that you're raising which is how much does this all cost, okay? And how do the costs get passed on to the consumer? Now, again, no surprises, I'm biased on this one. But I think that there's a false statement out there, which is that American food has never been so cheap. I don't think that's true, because I think a lot of the costs of American food are not paid for in the purchasing price of the piece of meat that you're buying. There are costs to the environment, there are costs to health, there are subsidies to the industries themselves that are essentially your taxpayers' dollars being paid to these people to do certain things. So it's not that I'm saying that they're not cheaper than they've ever been, but I think to say that they're unbelievably cheap may not be accurate. I think we need to look at it more and more closely. So um, I think your question is the great one. I think that's what needs to happen. I just think when it happens, it needs to have... Um, some of the community outside of the industry, because they do care about these things and they value it, it needs to have a proper quantification of the costs. And then the biggest question is, you know, how much is the, the public willing to pay, right? I mean, because it, it's a very true fact that if you ask people do they care a lot about animals, they say yes, and then they say, well, rank them how much you care opposed to terrorism, um, my particular paycheck, my concern about medical issues, my concern about the environment, and suddenly animal protection drops to the bottom. Okay, so how much do people care? A lot or not so much? It depends how you do it. I do think that it's been demonstrated that the public, and actually the guy who's done some really great work is Bailey Norwood, who is I think from, Ohio, from an agricultural school out in the Midwest, and he's shown that the American public is actually quite willing to pay quite a bit. You know, it may, you know it, it, they'll go like 20, 30, 40 percent, more than you would think, and that sometimes the cost isn't so much but sometimes the cost is a lot, and it is more than the American public would want to, to do, which is why, again, some people are like, well, maybe we shouldn't even be doing this industry to begin with, and there's a whole battle for that. Um, 
So it's a, it's a, it's a really, really complicated question. Yes? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess what I mean is they mean something, they definitely mean something, I just don't think they're an effective tactic. I don't think they're in any way going to change the face of what happens to animal production of, of, for food. I don't think the industry has made some great move that's going to result in their process continuing in any way for all of the issue, the reasons that you just said, which is that it goes to, to try and argue against transparency in the face of a world that is moving more and more to transparency more and more pressures on corporations to do transparency, more and more disclosure in the purchasing decision, more information available on the internet, more of all of this stuff. I think it's, I just don't think it's going to work. Um, you know, so I, I appreciate you pointing out that I wasn't clear on that point. Because yeah, it's, it's a problem, but I don't think it's a successful tactic. But I think as you correctly pointed out, the public really, really wants to know. And you guys want to know more than any of us. I mean, because you used to, you know everything now. and you. Seem to want to tell everyone about it, you know, and with your social networking and your this and that and the other. I mean, for you to be stopped from going into something and seeing it just feels wrong to you. And actually, most of you guys, when you do the studies, you're not even interested in politics anymore. I mean, you've sort of given up on the DC situation completely. You know, you, will, you might be interested in sort of venture capital and making money and trying to change the world through some great product, or you might be interested in not-for-profits and trying to change the world. And you are all interested in that through disclosure of information and some type of sort of resolving the issue. One other thing I want to say before I, before I forgot about the previous question about the pricing, it's also very hard to know how much products cost that are free range or whatever because if you go, what, what's happened is the, uh, appropriately, the, um, if you go into a retailer that's selling you something, they never sell you the cost, they sell you what you, they think your willingness to pay is. So, you know, the, pro the cost of an organic egg may be, or whatever egg may be X, but if they know there's a small community that will pay three times X, they pump it up. So when you see these, if these prices of products in, in, in stores that are much, much higher, they're not actually a reflection of the real cost. It's just there's a real profit margin there. Other questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think... One, it's a question of whether they're actually eating more meat in the United States. The meat production has declined in the last five, four or five years. Now, we can discuss whether that is because of welfare concerns or whether it's because it was a recession and so on. Most people seem to think that partially a switching of food choices, like which has happened over time. You know, maybe uh, at one point it was more into chickens and now maybe it's into these various things. Um, and there's definitely an overall growth because you've got to put in China and Latin America and everything. Um, so. Most people seem to think there are so many indicators now, whether it be the consumer, you know, compassionate consumerism, the pressure on all these industries to go free range, the um, growth of veganism as a lifestyle, the growth of veganism's food choices, and all of these things, that that plays an element to it. I, I think that um, we have such a huge issue with such a small timeline. I mean, to put it another way, I can make the argument from the animal rights, extreme animal rights perspective. You guys have been doing all this stuff to change the world and to make it better, but have you noticed that everyone's still eating all this meat? So everything you're doing is wrong. It's had no impact, no result at all. It's all useless. And my answer is, well, I don't know yet. You know, I mean, when you're dealing with trying to change something that is so heavily ingrained in our system and is ho heavily subsidized by our government and so heavily surrounded by economic interests, and you're trying to do it from what is originally a very small base, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not, there was like, what, two animal protection? Like, originally, there was like one big one and three small ones, trying to change this. 
And you look at the movement that has occurred in the last five or ten years, and you look at things like Ringling Brothers and, and the, the marine parks and veganism and everything else, I think that there's going to be very significant change in time. But from my perspective, since what, we're trying to, what people are trying to do, I'm trying to do, it's such an incredibly different way of looking at the world than we have been looking at it, to measure it in five or 10 or 15 year increments, maybe 15 or 20 year increments, personally. Um, but again, I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, is it going to be possible to raise animals much, much better and still have lot, lots of them done? Are they going to continue to genetically alter these animals so maybe you produce an animal that just doesn't notice or care? Um, is it going to be cultured meat? Is it going to be, you know, whatever? I don't know. But I don't think that the belief that there's something wrong with the system is going to change. And I think that's going to have consequences. In large part, not only because of the ethical issues. I mean, I came into this movement from an ethical basis. But it's now I'm joined by climate change people, environmentalists, everyone, just all getting in because there's problems here. Other questions? Yes. That's such a good question. Um, I don't know. The one area, I mean, I've had a lot of people criticize um, animal labeling for many good reasons. But I do think, in particular, in the type of bird that, that is now being created, which has a whole host of health issues, according to the information that I've seen. And, I, and from what I've spoken to in people in the in, you know, people in the industry, the industry recognizes these issues. And actually, I think the industry is actually trying to design an animal that will grow a little less aggressively but has less welfare concerns. And so I actually think the most likely avenue for change here will be the labeling system. Because if you can get enough of a purchasing power through somewhere like Whole Foods, who's able to deliver a level three bird, in large part because the level three bird is genetically different and better than as a hope. And I've actually seen some discussion of that. Um, but I think it's one of the things I didn't mention, which is obviously the genetic alteration of animals is part of this stuff and what that causes if you don't kill them immediately or on the way. Um, and the, in, with breeding birds in particular, there seems to be a recognition now within the industry as well that they maybe need to change to a different genetic prototype that will have a different consequence than that they're having at this point. Any other questions? Well, it's an interesting question, I, I, I may be reading too much into it, because it says, why are animal welfare activists frightened of anthropomorphizing as opposed to animal rights activists? Because um, I don't think animal rights activists are that frightened of anthropomorphizing. Um, I, I, I feel like animal welfare activists are probably appropriately concerned. I mean, there's so many, I've got, I, the problem being teaching, I just want to break it into seven components and the six things we should talk about. Um, you know, the first thing is I imagine animal welfare ab uh, advocates or people involved in the animal welfare movement feel that they have an appropriate ethical obligation to make sure that the decisions they make are appropriately informed by science and objective determinations as opposed to romantic or mythological you know, interpretations or intuitions. And that, I think, makes total sense. But I don't think it makes sense to ignore intuitions that are supported by many reasons and that you can use a whole series of arguments to suggest that well, there are similarities in the way that, you know, we see this, in, and again, you guys know so much more about this than me, but when you look at the understanding of animal cognition and animal behavior in the last 30 or 40 years, and sort of revolution in scientific understandings of whether it be dogs or elephants or whatever else it is, a lot of the stuff that people were saying was that's just so anthropomorphic, it's got to be wrong, has actually been proven to be somewhat correct on the basis of objective determinations about genetic similarities, perfect, you know, evolutionary advantages and reasons why there would be things, similarity across species, and all of these culture, all of these reasons that it makes sense. So um, 
I think excessive anthropomorphization is wrong, and our culture is so bizarre because on the one hand, we excessively anthropomorphize for everything, whether it be the books our kids read, the Walt Disney movies we take them to, the uh, animals that we ask them to do, and all of this stuff. And on the other side, we ignore animals so profoundly in so many ways while supposedly professing this, this great attachment and belief to them. And that's, of course, one of the things that you know, is fascinating about our relationships with animals is that we, and you guys know this again better than I do, because I imagine a large number of you guys are going to be small animal vets, and so you know how much people care about animals. You know how much money people put into their animals, you know how much they bond with them, how they view them as a member of their family, how I spend a lot of time doing cases where people, unfortunately you guys, would negligently or accidentally, or not through any fault of your own, kill someone's pet, and then they would want to bring a lawsuit, and it would be all a question, well, animals should have you know, a, an owner's emotional distress for the loss of their animals should be recognized. And that has not been accepted by the American legal system, that argument. But for most people that I spoke to who had their pets and they lost them, the fact that the law wouldn't recognize what was objectively an appropriate attachment to a living being that they had some type of two-way relationship with that involved some real, real personal connection was astonishing to them. Like, mind-boggling. Like, and, and you guys' profession is based upon that and that connection. Um, but at the same time, when you actually look at the reality of how animals are treated, our society seems quite far from that belief. So I, there's danger all over this one. You know, it's a great question, and there's a lot of issues around it. Uh, well, I'd like to thank David for his, his presentation today.